Yes, welcome to another, I, I think, I hope, very, very interesting panel. Thanks to our wonderful panelist, originally from Germany, now from California, Stanford professor, Sebastian Trun. How do you spell your, I mean, how you, should I, I mean, in German it's Trun, and what is it in American? It's Thrun? Okay, Sebastian Thrun. I met Sebastian, and I have to be very honest to you, Sebastian, our relationship, our young relationship, started with a lie. I'm sorry, I have to, yes, I, I have to confess this here a little bit in public because I met you more or less on a park deck in Long Beach where you told me, would you like to have a, dry, a drive in my driverless car? Uh, and I th thought, well, this sounds like fun. And it was really on a very narrow park deck and I sat down in this car with nobody next to me driving this car, it's a ghost car. And off it went. It was horribly, it was an alarming speed. And it, it was like, I thought, this is the worst thing. And it went on and on. I hoped it was going to stop. And I came out and he said, how was it? I said, wonderful. It was great. And the only thing that really felt great is that I made it out of this car. You know, so this was a lie, Sebastian. But everything else, my admiration for you and the honor to have you here is not a lie at all. Because Sebastian, I don't know if you know, Sebastian was one of the... Spiritus Rector, can I say, of Google Street View, a very important part of this. He's the chief engineer of the, that, what the New York Times called the Google's lab for wildest dreams. But unfortunately, this is so clandestine what they're doing there that he's not going to talk about it. Maybe, I mean, I have some questions for you, Sebastian, maybe, later? No, no, okay. But today he's going to talk about something. This is a new, wie sagt man? And Durchbruch, a groundbreaking uh, th a breakthrough of, um, yeah, something that, you know, could shake up the world of the universities, the way education is looked at today. And I'm very happy that you're going to talk about this amazing project. Come up on stage, Sebastian Thrun. Thank you. I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here. And of all the introductions I've received in my entire scientific career, this was by far the most recent. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about cars. I'm not going to talk about Google X. I just want to tell you a story, a story that changed my life in a, in a really profound way. And the story starts at TED, where I met Maria. There was a speaker whose name was Salman Khan. Has anyone here heard about Khan Academy? Raise your hand. Salman is a former investment banker who recorded short videos about topics in mathematics and business that reached millions of high school students. Now, to make my story complete, at the time I was a fully tenured Stanford professor, and at Stanford, we teach classes to 20, 30 students. My class drew 200, so I was a successful professor. And here's this guy who teaches millions. So, come my next class, I decided it's embarrassing, I'm only teaching 200 students. So let's take it online. And here's my entire marketing department. We send out one email, and this is the complete email I'm showing you. Let me just highlight three points in this email. Uh, it said that we are offering our class to the world free of charge, and to understand how revolutionary free of charge is, Stanford already offered my class to the world for $1,500. The students were to take the same exams uh, as Stanford students, so they could compare themselves and they would get, in the end, a certificate. Peter and I sat down and asked, how many students will we attract? We felt maybe 500, Peter said 1,000. And we woke up, we had 5,000 students, 10,000, and within days, we had 160,000 students sign up. So we were to teach 160,000 students. Oh my God. How many days would that take? So, we scrambled, we put together a small technology team. 
We built a really ugly website, and we started recording ourselves day and night. And just to show you how primitive our technology was, it was literally a camera, a pen, and a napkin. And we would record things like I'd these. Like to teach you is called the separation. And let me I guess the sound isn't start working. the discussion of this concept by a quiz. We have here a base network, and I'm going to ask you a conditional independence question. So, the online medium is quite amazing. We decided to, to flip the entire way we teach. Rather than lecturing students, we decided to quiz students. We would ask them a question, and then our website would play that question. I would narrate it, as you can see here. And then the question would turn into a quiz. And the student could venture their guesses. Our automated grading software would tell which one's right, which one's wrong. And then after I let the student think about things, we would tell them what the right answer is. So the principal way of engaging is that the student has to think. And by doing this, we empower the student to learn new skills, which is fundamentally different from the way lectures take place at universities today. Um, here's a, another side. We could do multiple choice or numerical answers. And we recorded this day and night to the <laughs> detriment of my marriage and my family life, my sleep. Um, one class took me about maybe 10, 15 hours to record. And then something bizarre happened. I was teaching the same class at Stanford to 200 students. On day one, we had this full class of 200 students. And just two or three weeks in, the class was empty. There were only 30 students showing up. So I asked the students, what's happening? Why are you not coming to class? And they all said, they should prefer me on video. <laughs> they can rewind me on video. They can quietly see me when they're in transit. You got to think about this. These are students who pay $30,000 a year to Stanford University to see the best and most famous of all professors, and they prefer us on video? That was a big shock to us. The class went on. We drew 160,000 students from all over the world. I want to show you some emails we received. Um, we had a volunteer army of nearly 2,000 translators that translated our class in up to 44 languages. There was a huge amount of student participation to curate this class, add materials, there were discussion groups set up, Facebook groups set up. This became an entire counterculture. In terms of number of students, 160,000 students, um, I was teaching more students than Stanford has. There were, in fact, more students from small countries like Lithuania in my class than Stanford has students. And we received lots of emails, and these are the emails that really made me changed my way of thinking, changed my life. These individual people that came to me and said, here's a story I want to tell you. So here's one email, it's kind of long. I'm going to read a piece to you, a part of it to you. It's from Afghanistan. Okay, let me just highlight a short segment. I spent the last few days under incoming mortar and rocket attack, then dodging checkpoints under questionable legal status to exfiltrate a war zone to a third world airfield until things settle down. I had, had about an hour on a fairly solid internet connectivity to be able to give the assignments uh, done and still manage to get a respectable score. This is a typical week, week for me. There was a guy in the fields in Afghanistan under mortar attack, running for his life every day, but he spent an hour at night to do his homework assignments and to learn about AI. It's unbelievable. <laughs> This is a, a cut-down of a much, much longer email, but the gist of it was the following. It was a, a mother of two children. I work 40-plus hours a week. I'm a single mother of two, and my younger child is only seven months old. I have no time to concentrate or to dedicate. I've still been hanging onto the class by my fingernails, wanting to learn and to feel a sense of accomplishment. Just before homework five was due, I suffered another series of great, chaotic difficulties in my life. My job has been threatened by the economic climate. My personal life uh, kind of exploded. I'm on my own with the children. The baby has been sick. 
a family member is suddenly sick, another losing their home, the list goes on and on. Why am I telling you too much personal stuff? Because on November 13th, I gave up. I told myself that it was ridiculous to think I could justify continuing this class, taking this time, given all the other problems that surrounded me. And then, that Monday morning, I checked my email and I saw a note you sent me on Saturday. And I stared at it for a while. Then I sighed and I told to myself, I can't quit now. I took the midterm this weekend, mostly while holding a teething infant. None of my issues have gone away, but I feel more determined than ever to see this through for myself, because I want to, because it makes me feel good. These are not your typical Stanford student. This is not your elite student who comes to Stanford for years. These are working men and women. These are people of all ages, from age 13 to 70. These are people in all countries, in Africa, in Asia. I was able to, with this class, to touch lives of this lady who was holding her teething infant in one hand and doing the midterm with the other. And then I received emails that were not quite as positive. Here's my favorite critical email. It's about a gentleman whose daughter is taking this class and who didn't like it. And here are it's a very short sentence that really moved me. Um, the complaint is that this is a reader class. Um, the complaint is that the class is set up in a way that doesn't motivate but puts really harsh materials in front of the students and tests them whether they can do it. And I thought about this email for a long while, and it was absolutely true. In all my life of teaching, my 20 years of teaching at Carnegie Mellon at Stanford, I'd always been a tough teacher. I'd always given students really hard questions, I'd always let them fail, and it would come to their rescue making myself look really smart. Here was no purpose of reading. This was an open university. There was no reason to reduce class size. There was no certificate to be earned. And here I was teaching a reader class. And then I started to realize that we really set up our students not for success, but for failure. We really empower the professors by looking smart, and we don't really help the students to become smart. And this was just one example of a person who was dropping out because I was the smart ass didn't help her. I started realizing that grades are the failure of the education system. Give me somebody a three or a four, or as you say in Germany, an ausreichend or mangelhaft, just means that we, the educators, failed to get them to A plus level. So rather than grading students with grades, as I'd done in the beginning of the class, my task had to be to make students successful and get everybody to an A plus level. So it couldn't be about harsh questions and difficult questions where they had one chance and when they got it wrong, they got a C. We changed the entire system to make it so the questions were still hard. We gave more assistance, we let them take them multiple times, and if they finally got them right, they would get their A+, plus, and I think it was much better for that. That really made me think about the education system as a whole. Salman Khan has this wonderful story. When you learn to ride a bicycle, and that's quoting from his talk, um, and you fail to learn a bicycle, then you don't stop learning a bicycle, give the person a D, and move on to a unicycle. You keep training them as long as it takes to, to ride a bicycle, and then they can ride a bicycle. Our classes today, in math, for example, when someone fails, we don't take the time that they need to, to make the student a strong student. We give them a C, or a D, or an, an F, and then we move on to the next class, and now they're already brand marked as losers, they miss the necessary skills and knowledge, and they're set up for failure. This medium has the opportunity to fundamentally change all of this. Another question came up, and I think this email beautifully summarizes the sentiment. How can you make a personal experience with 160,000 students? And to put this into context, in, in Europe, in Asia, and the United States, we have a big educational debate. And we all know that large class sizes are detrimental to the educational effect. In fact, we all believe the way to solve education problems is to make classes small. 20 students, 
15 students. So a class with 160,000 students can't work. And yet, we get emails like this one over here that says, it feels more intimate than most of the lectures I attended in the past. I feel that you both are personally tutoring me. We managed with the prim primitive nature of the medium, the fact that we had a napkin and a pen on a piece of paper, to give people the feeling we're sitting right next to them, we're talking to them, we're listening, and we're responding to them. And of course, we weren't. It was all pre-canned. But it was, it was almost like magic. The students really felt a sense of connectivity, connection to me as an instructor. So here's one student speaking about the class. This free AI class literally liberated me, gave a new direction to my life. I'm highly motivated because, because of this class. I'm gonna take great strides in my previous interests of image processing, computer vision, and robotics using AI class so that I can solve maybe some of the problems affecting mankind in the third world countries and India in particular. I'm literally overwhelmed at the possibilities after this class and I hope and I'm, I'm sure that it's going to be people like me who are going to make the future a whole lot better. Thank you, AI class team. Bye. Hmm. AI class for me and for so many others was nothing short of the gift of life. It opened for me the door to a vast amount of knowledge to use for my research and gave me the thrill of being a student again. AI class reminded me and continues to inspire me to always think of the most exciting dynamic ways that I can to solve problems. With the help of the class, I have necessary background required to further my education myself. I learned many algorithms and applications which helps me a lot in my research of com computer vision. I have never thought math can be so fun before I saw these schools. In AI class, I got to learn some really exciting stuff and talk about it with people from all over the world. I discovered an exciting and fascinating field for free and from my kitchen. AI class reconnected me, re-engaged me, and re-energized me intellectually. We are now moving into an age where anybody can be a lifelong learner. The course gave me a great will to continue self-education. Convinced me that I wanted to work in the field of robotics. Really gave me huge appreciation for the field. Keep the skills in favor of my decision in pursuing advanced graduate studies. It helped me to realize that if I focus, I can really accomplish anything. I might even be able to program my own self-driving car. Online learning is going to make the world a closer and better place. It cannot be overstated how groundbreaking these online learning methods are. This has been really a great opportunity for people around the world to learn from the best experts, no matter where they come from or how much money they have. Maybe we should rethink education. The university was invented in 1088, about 1,000 years ago. At the time, 350 years before Gutenberg, the lecture was the most effective way to convey information. We had the industrialization, we had the invention of celluloid, of digital media, and miraculously, professors today teach exactly the same way they taught 1,000 years ago. The university has been the most, surprisingly, the least innovative of all places in society. Perhaps we should reconsider and think about media, new media, for teaching that can personalize themselves and help students to become effective. One thing I was particularly proud, by the way, is that we had a group of women that interacted very closely in this class of several thousand women. In computer science, it's really rare that women have a chance um, and, and in this medium, they felt much more respected and, and protected than they feel in an open classroom. Um, so, the effect that had on me was really profound. I, I never thought that, that this would happen. I always felt I was at Stanford, the world's best university, and I was a great teacher. 
Having done this, I can't teach at Stanford again. Sorry, Jure, as much as I love Stanford. It's impossible. I've, I feel like there's a red pill and a blue pill, and you can take the blue pill and go back to your classroom and lecture your 20 students, but I've taken the red pill, and I've seen Wonderland. It can really change the world, I think, with education. If you can make education free for the world, accessible everywhere, I think we can help people in the developing world, in Africa, in India, in China, to become much better, much stronger. And I think that's going to be the core to a new society. I'm extremely excited about this. I gave up tenure at Stanford. I'm now launching my own platform for online teaching. It actually is launching today. Oh. We have... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And along with using the digital medium, I really want to stop empowering the professors. They really look smart, and I want to empower the student. So our very first class is a seven weeks class that David Evans will teach, a professor at University of Virginia, who's now working for us. And in this class, he'll go from no programming skills whatsoever, so technically all of you can take this class, although most of you have programming skills, and in seven weeks' time, you can build a Google. You can build your own search engine. Just imagine what this can mean, and I hope will mean, for hundreds of thousands of people around the world. That they can all of a sudden acquire a skill in an online class that can give them an existence, a business, a perspective. Programming is really important for around the world right now um, in this time and age. So this class is launching. I'm also teaching a class on how to build a robotic car. Here's David. Uh, we have a website called Udacity. And I would love to deploy on all of you to spread the world. Blog about it, write about it, tell your friends, your kids about it, your colleagues. As amazing people who wish to be educated today, you might not even guess, spread the world. And if you do this, you can be an important contributor to making education available for the entire world for free. And it's going to be absolutely free of charge. So please talk about it. We hope to get 500,000 students enrolled. It's an ambitious number, but why not? Um, and I really would love that all of you can help me do this. Thank you. <laughs>